everyone. This is the second lecture of the digital systems class. Um, in this session, we'll learn about information representation, number systems, in particular decimal, binary, hexadecimal, octal number systems. And uh, we'll cover base conversions. Um, we'll have discussions regarding decimal codes, parity coding, and gray codes. And the details will subsequently follow after covering those important topics. Digital systems deal with discrete quantities of information. They either emerge from the nature of the data that's being discrete and processed, or may be quantized from a continuous process. The discrete information from whatever the source it's coming from is represented by what's called signals. The signals in most present day electronic digital systems use just two discrete values and therefore they are called binary. A binary digit called a bit has two values 0 and 1. They can be mathematically represented by 0 and 1 as we know in decimal format or logically true or false or in more physical quantities like low voltage or high voltage depending on the application these representations are quite crucial. In summary, a digital system is a system that manipulates those discrete elements of information represented internally in a binary form. In this representative figure, you can see various forms of signals. On top, you see the clock time axis where equidistant arrows show where the clock ticks are. Right below it, you will see an analog signal that takes a continuum of real signal values in time. This signal is continuous in both value and in time. Lastly, two discrete signals are shown on top of each other, showing synchronous and asynchronous forms of digital waveforms. I want you to notice the waveform changes in clock ticks for the synchronous signal. That's why it, co it is called discrete digital signal in both value and time. So what are the physical quantities that represent the logical 0 and 1? If you think of electronic circuits, it might be the voltage or current. If you think the magnetic fields direction could be where you have 0 and 1 on the surface of disk drives. Compact disks, for example, use surface pits and light to represent 0 and 1. Dynamic RAM or solid state devices use electric charges to represent 0 and 1. And finally, quantum devices use electron spin directions to represent 0 and 1. Let's just briefly introduce number systems. Number systems are defined based on two features, the positive radix or base and positional coefficients. In some of the literature, number systems are also referred as positional systems. If the base or radix is 10, the number system is called decimal number system. As you can see from the example, there are digits, 10 uh, different digits, 0 to 9, and in our example we've got 11.9 where it's represented by 1 times 10 to the 1 plus 1 times 10 to the 0 plus 9 times 10 to the minus 1. If the base in radix is 2 then it is called binary number system. As you can see the di digits are 0 and 1 in this case. The example is 1001.01 .01 can be you can convert that number which is in binary number system to a decimal binary system to the same way 1 times 2 to the 3 plus 1 times 2 to the 0 and 1 times 2 to the minus 2 if you calculate the number you will have 9.25 in decimal number system there are also other important number systems that they include but not limited to octal or hexadecimal number systems since digits are represented by a single sign, it is conventional to use A, B, C, D, E, and F to represent 
the six other digits of hexadecimal number system. Since we're interested in representing discrete quantities in terms of binary bit sequences, it is of interest to consider the range of binary numbers. As an example, consider for how many decimal numbers can be represented by three bits. It is given through counting arguments that each bit position is flipped to get two to the three possibilities, which is in our case is eight. And those mass decimal numbers that represent that eight different combinations is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. In general, an n bit number represents a total of two to the n distinct numbers. And the minimum is where you have all the bits zero, which is the minimum. Uh, the maximum that you can attain uh, by having all bits uh, flipped to one is two to the n minus one. It is also interesting to consider um, uh, bits after the radix point. For example, if m of n bits uh, are after the radix point, minimum is apparently zero because all bits are going to be zero. The maximum, however, is left as a homework problem. But you can guess that the maximum number would be uh, all ones after the radix point. So let us consider the following in-class exercise. Compute how many bits are needed to represent each byte position in an 8 gigabyte flash disk. The hint for this class exercise uh, I'm going to give is the fact that 1 gigabyte is 2 to the 30 bytes. We'll talk about it later. The hex number system is as popular as binary number system due to its shorthand notation and easy binary conversion rules. Most computer manuals use either octal or hexadecimal numbers to specify binary quantities. This is mainly because binary numbers could be quite large. On the other hand, hexadecimal digits can be represented by 4 bits. Moreover, conversion is quite straightforward. As you can see from the example, 1000 is represented by 8. You basically group 4 bits at a time and you convert those 4 bits uh, to the hexadecimal number system through a simple uh, conversion table. The second group, 1110, has a representation of E, and the radix point stays the intact, and 111 converts back to F in the hexadecimal number system. There are two in-class exercises I want you to consider and think, think about them. We'll cover those later. Let's talk about the conversion rules between different bases. We convert the integer and fraction parts separately. To convert the integer part, divide the number by the base repeatedly and save the remainders. Result is the remainders in the reverse order of, order of appearance. To convert the fractional part, we multiply the fraction by the base repeatedly and save the integer digits. The result is the integer digits in order of appearance. To illustrate our point and the procedure, let's consider an example. The example is to convert 117 point eight nine in decimal number system to hexadecimal number system. Let's take the integer part, 117, which is written in base 10. We divide it by 16. In this case, 177, 117 is the dividend, 116 is the divisor, 7 is quotient, and remainder is 5. And then we take the quotient and divide it by 16 again. The quotient in, that, in this case is 0, and remainder is 7. We basically read off in reverse order, and the most significant digit in this case would be 7, and the least significant digit is going to be 5. We take the fractional part next. It's 0 0.89 in base 10. We multiply it by 16 to get 14.24, and integer is 14, which corresponds to E in hexadecimal system. 0 0.24 is the remainder. We take it by s and multiply by 16 to get 3.84, an integer in this case is going to be 3. We take the again the remainder 0.84, multiply by 16, and get 13.44, an integer is going to be 13, which corresponds to D in the hexadecimal part, so on and so forth. 
we read off in the order of appearance in this case the most significant digit will be e the second most significant will be three and the and and so on and so forth in this case the final results approximately going to be 75.e3d7 in hexadecimal format the conversion between binary, octal, and decimal number systems is quite straightforward. We partition the binary sequence in groups of 3 bits for octal and 4 bits for hexadecimal number system with respect to the radix point. The example shown in the table illustrates this point. So we ask ourselves, how about octal and hexadecimal conversion? One way is to convert the octal number to binary and then we convert the binary back to hexadecimal number system since we know how we convert from octal to binary and binary to hexadecimal this conversion of octal to hexadecimal should be straightforward to you binary addition is quite central to digital systems let's assume we have binary digits x and y when you add these two binary digits, uh, there is going to be a sum value, which is represented by one bit, and a carry value, which is also represented by another bit. These two tables, shown in blue, are there to illustrate the possible cases with Z being 0 and 1. There is this notion of complements of binary numbers. Complements are useful in digit arithmetic for performing subtraction and logical manipulation. For binary numbers, there are two types of complements. The one is called ones complement. It's easy to perform the ones complement by changing ones to zeros and zeros to ones. The other is a twos complement. It is simple to go from ones complement to twos complement by adding one to the ones complement. Let us consider the subtraction operation with two's complement, as illustrated by a flow diagram where x and y are two binary sequences. We start taking two's complement of one of the two variables, say y. We add x and the two's complement of y to produce one bit carry, and the result, which is represented by the value sum. If the carry is one, then the sum is the final result of subtraction operation. If the carry is zero, then the final result is negative of sum. As an exercise, I want you to think about the subtraction operation using one's complement instead of two's complement and draw a similar flow diagram to explain it. We have an example here where x is 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 0, y is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, and we compute the x minus y, seven, uh, x minus y um, and x is 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 and the 2's complement of y is given by 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 if you do perform the addition operation you will have a carry of 1 and the sum value as the as since the carry is 1 the the sum uh, well, the result is going to be the sum itself without the negative sign Since in digital system, every discrete quantity must be represented by a sequence of binary values to be processed and transferred. There usually are mappings between those discrete values and their corresponding binary representations. It is customary to call those representations as binary codes. For n-bit representation, for example, a binary code is a mapping from a set of symbols to a subset of 2 to the n possible binary code words. Let us consider a representation table to map 10 decimal number system digits to binary code words. Since there are 10 decimal digits, namely 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, we should at least use 4 bits to be able to represent each one of those numbers or digits in decimal number system. In that case, code words 1010 zero, zero, 1011, 1100011111011111 are not used because we have only 10 decimal digits and 10 code words are enough to represent that. This special mapping is called binary coded decimal. 
BCD, in other words. In this coding strategy, each decimal digit mapped to exactly four bits, which makes the conversion quite easy. Let us consider a frequent real-life case. Suppose that 235 in base 10 is transmitted, and the receiver end, end, ends up getting the corrupted version um, uh, one of the bits is flipped during transmission. It is easy to show that the error value due to this flip is 4. So a rather more interesting question is whether we can minimize this error by devising another mapping strategy. Please try to have some thoughts on this, as it is definitely not very sophisticated. We will explore more about this problem in the classroom. Finally, I would like to touch upon parity coding for error detection in binary sequences. If you want to detect and correct errors, you definitely need to add some redundant information. The simplest form of this redundancy is called parity bit added to make the number of ones even or odd. For example, you transmit 1001101, where the last bit is the computed parity. We use even parity in this case. If the received sequence has one bit flipped due to transmission error, you can easily detect that as the number of ones in the received word is going to be odd. Think about if this code can detect multiple errors. Finally, to get the correct information, receiver requests another transmission line till the received data is error free. In the next class, we'll learn more about logic gates, Boolean algebra, and start exploring combinational logic circuits. Please direct any questions you might have about this lecture to my email address, and thank you.